All right, we're back to the TriMet board meeting, also known as the TriMet aristocrats. You know, the people that don't do anything for a living but make huge amounts of money. They call them the TriMet executive staff who are enabled by this TriMet board who are a bunch of elitists who are appointed by the governor to support the TriMet general manager. And they're still doing public testimony and... Thanks to a new Twitter person who happens to go by the name of Happy Goat, uh, I forgot, the, Happy Goat, let's call him, I have a little more time on my hands because he's pretty much taking over the uh, dispatch, I can't even keep up with his tweets, never mind comb for my own dispatch calls anymore, so that frees me up for uh, other things like this uh, board meeting which I have been very a derelict in keeping up with since the uh, scanner has come back online. As you know, the scanner was down for a, about a year. So I had plenty of time to do other things related to transit. But since that scanner has been up, I've been pretty much obsessed with it since. Uh, so I haven't had time to do other things. But, oh, Happy Goat Dance, that's what he did, yeah. Since Happy Goat Dance has uh, been doing a lot of the uh, the calls I now have time <laughs> anyway let's get back to this board meeting and they're still doing public testimony I'd like to speak now like to speak now all right so I guess we'll call up Annalise Kohler uh, and is there uh, others also want to come up why don't you come on up I don't think I have are you are you Matt nope okay why don't you come on up too Um, hello everyone, my name is Larry Hale and I come here in a unique position because I was a former transit official. I used to work for the city of Boston in the MBTA in their accessibility department. MBTA. And I'd say I started traveling to Portland two years ago, well not two years ago, in 2002. And I remember my experience then, um, I was trying to find a hotel, I got down to uh, to um, Pioneer Square. Um, there was a supervisor who helped me out after he saw that I had trouble. Um, he would have even went above and beyond to help me actually take me to my hotel, but because I needed to figure it out on my own, he followed the bus that I took. When I got <laughs> off the bus, he gave me the assistance I needed to locate the hotel and the <laughs> bus I needed to get back into the city. And I Wow, that's <laughs> that was 2002. That's pretty uh, that's pretty good service there. I bring this up uh, to uh, talk about uh, this whole aspect of customer service um, in the MBTA. Um, for years, oh, we've he, had the tagline driven by. Oh, I think he's blind, right? That's what I, I think he's blind. By customer service and I think back uh, to that situation in 2002 and I remember that that was one of the reasons why I had fallen in love with TriMet and the city of Portland uh, that type of help that I got was completely unparalleled um, yeah that was uh, 15 years ago by the way and it's not the same place anymore fast forward to when there was a move to um, create the um, when uh, these there was a shift toward um, really looking at trying to collect affairs, and I got the oh, wow uh, feeling as though it was um, a little harmful toward uh, customers. And I do understand the importance of really making sure that you get the revenue. Uh, no, the two dollars and fifty cents is a drop in the bucket to TriMet, and it's not imp this. <laughs> you know, I uh, have had <laughs> ongoing um, philosophical battles with the fair inspection since they decided to do away with Fair Square, and all of a sudden, the McFarland and his crew decided there's going to be a zero tolerance. Uh, my buddy Eli Ritchie, who's <laughs> recently been. <laughs> 
busted by the police and phony uh, cases is, was bringing a lot of this out. Uh, he was actually writing the system and showing the police state aspect of the TriMet system. And we need to always remember here, you're talking about $2.50. You're talking about a very insignificant amount of money. So have the police state involved in a $2.50 fare is an abomination as far as I'm concerned. There's something go else going on there besides the fare. And, you, and people that have any understanding of government understand what I'm talking about. This isn't about the fare. This is about control of control and manipulation of the economically depressed populations. Okay, because the 250 fare doesn't do anything. I mean, you have Fred Hansen, former general manager, living on a luxurious $17,000 a month pension after spending only 10, a little over 10 years at TriMet. He's, he's living a life of relative luxury, but here they have these goon squads trying to squeeze $2.50 out of the poor population. Um, let's let's see where he goes with this. Um, because that helps toward operating costs and things like that. Um, but uh, as people said, um, sometimes there are extenuating circumstances. The fare machines don't work or there may be card issues. So it's my hope that you will consider what everyone has been talking about as it relates to um, the low income fare. Um, but I really want to touch on that whole customer service aspect, um, really uh, focusing on making sure that customers feel welcome to take the system. When we treat, sometimes there's uh, an unintended one to, because we're trying to collect the fares, it, we sometimes look and treat the customers as um, these people who don't want to pay the fare. Um, that's not necessarily uh, the case. I uh, really encourage you guys to really look toward uh, that aspect of customer service in, all, in all aspects, um, how operators deal with uh, customers, how even uh, people who work in the corporate office deal with customers, um, really working to ensure access. Um, it's my hope that as you kind of go forward, you listen to what everyone has been saying about the low income fare and look at TriMet as a whole and look at ways to ensure that uh, everyone has a good ride and that everyone feels welcome on the system. Thanks. Well, obviously he's right on and trying to present this in a civilized fashion. So good for him. That's, I'll score one for him. Thank you. I appreciate your comment. Yeah, I said Warner. Really? Good, Good morning, morning TriMet Board of Directors. My name oh, is, is Annalisa Curler, and I work for Oregon Food Bank. I also serve as the chair of TIAC. I am oh. here today to express Oregon Food Bank's overwhelming support for the implementation of a low-income fare by TriMet. Oregon Food Bank's mission is to end hunger. You know, we don't need to. Why are they going through all of this congratulatory nonsense it's been passed by the elites have decided to do this and of course you know i know there's they just extracted five billion dollars okay from the citizens of oregon there was not one dissenting voice in that extraction they never gave the citizens of oregon even a chance to vote on this they just took the money uh, so I, what are they? So they gave the public this little sop. They gave them twelve million a year to the low income, to the people that are not the elites. You know. Uh, uh, so I don't understand why we're having this parade of people congratulating them now. Where were you in 2012 when they got rid of the Fairless Square? They got rid of the one zone fare. Where were you then? You were nowhere. No, so you come out now and you say how wonderful it is that they're doing it now after it's safe. I, I, you know, I don't, I don't buy it, man. Where were you when we needed you? And its root causes. We work statewide to distribute food to Oregonians experiencing hunger through a network of food banks, food pantries, and emergency meal sites. Last year... Uh, needless to say, of course, I support the food bank, but I, <laughs> I question why they're here now today. 
that network distributed over 100 million pounds of food to an estimated... Wait a minute, hold on. What is this, some kind of advertisement? You're, why, are you, why are you telling us about the food bank here when we want... This is TriMet. Let's discuss TriMet issues. This is not an advertisement. 740,000 people. You may wonder why the food bank is coming to talk to you about transit. Transportation is a key issue for many of the people we serve. And many of them rely on public transportation to get to where they need to go. They use your buses and max lines to get to work, to doctor's appointments, to the grocery store, and to our food pantries. The two main concerns we hear from clients regarding transit are the cost of a bus pass and the desire for increased service to their neighborhoods. For example, a client in Rockwood told us they plan their trips to the grocery store around when they already know they're going to be out and about and utilizing a bus pass. The reality of this is that they tell us they often go two to three weeks between grocery store trips. Clients from a school pantry in David Douglas tell us they use their bikes to balance and carry food boxes a mile and a half home from a pantry because they cannot afford a bus fare. This low income fare will significantly reduce the cost for riding the bus for the families we serve. It will free up much needed dollars to be spent on important items like food, utility bills, medical costs, and rent. I know that at least $72 of monthly savings may not sound a lot to many Oregonians, but to Oregonians experiencing hunger, it's significant. It's a week worth of groceries yep, or an yep, energy yep. bill. I also spend a lot of my time advocating for various programs to help Oregonians experiencing hunger. I spend time down in Salem and here locally talking to legislators and government officials about various anti-hunger and anti-poverty programs. We talk to them about housing assistance, homelessness programs, very energy good, very assistance, good public speaker, programs. isn't she? And so while there is a lot more that can be done, I also want to say that this is a very robust assistance program. Eligibility guidelines of 200% of the federal poverty level and up to a 70% reduction in fare is substantial. Seven, yeah. We really appreciate TriMet's commitment <laughs> to creating a program that works to serve so many Oregonians struggling to make ends meet and also recognizes the need for such considerable assistance. Thank you. And we urge that when the time comes, yeah, yeah. you adopt okay. this low-income fare program. Obviously, they're going to adopt. It's already been passed. Jesus Christ. Thank you very much. I'm impressed. <laughs> yeah, you're impressed, Warner. Warner. Warner's and, a head and thanks for, for what you do also. It's great. <laughs> thanks. Uh, for, that, that actually concludes, I believe, uh, the public forum. I have nobody else who's signed up. Again, I want to thank you all for, uh, for coming and pre presenting today. All right. I will point out also for everybody watching it. Let me move forward here because... Director uh, Bauman? Yes, good morning, uh, everybody. These are the committee reports. They're useless. Who cares? Um, okay. Oh, wait. Okay, that looks like the diversity. The director of diversity. That's so I understand that we have a, a good stand-in from uh, from the TX. So if you could give us a report, please. Oh, yeah. Certainly. Uh, the transit equity. <laughs> Okay, yeah. So let's hear what the the. Uh, <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, President Warner and members of the board. Just a quick update on what happened in November at the TAC meeting. Um, we discussed meeting logistics. We're planning to move our regular meeting to Center Street, mostly because it's better situated for the TAC members. It's closer to more public transportation options and has more ADA considerations as well, and easier for some of our uh, members who use Lyft. Um, so that will begin this month, and people are pretty excited about it. Um, Carl Green, our new um, Title VI program, uh, Title VI and Equity Program Administrator, walked TX through the FY19 service changes and the Title VI draft, Title VI analysis he performed, as well as the approach he's going to be what? He's, was using to perform the Title VI analysis for the, the low Title VI program. Title VI, useless um, we bureaucracy. We did on our transportation summits that we held in Gresham, Beaverton, and Clackamas. The focus of those was to get feedback on how HOP implementation was going. All right, so there you go. Uh, let me make a point here because it, what seems so simple to me, TriMet just doesn't do it. I mean, they had so he just said they had transportation summits. Well, where's the videos of that stuff? Why are you, you know, uh, why aren't these people 
videotaping every single event that they have and putting it on everything, whatever it is, if it's a public hearing, public meeting, uh, a meeting of uh, just information, all that stuff should be gathered in a, in a video library so we can all see it. But they do not do that. They do not do that, which means none of it is real. Because all they do is brag about it. They don't actually show us what happened, but they brag about it. That's how we know it's all phony, because they don't show us anything. They tell us how wonderful they are, but they don't show us anything. But also some input on the program design for the new low-income fare program, as well as the administrative hearing process, which went very well. We attracted about 40 or so community-based organizations across the... 48 the organizations, zero. Um, and we also people. talked about... Um, New member recruitment. We have two tra uh, TIAC members transitioning off, and so we want to make sure we have a good representation from the Tri-County area, but also from organizations and folks who are either transit-dependent or serving transit-dependent communities. So it was a very good conversation, and we're having uh, our next meeting tomorrow evening. So overall, all in all, good. Any questions for John Gardner, by the way? I guess that guy's black. Boy, that's the, one of the whitest black men I've ever seen. So. <laughs> Uh, on this, on the report. Okay, thank you, John, very much. That's it. That's it. Well, let's move on to uh, the next one: is the accountability committee. Oh. And Dr. Bethard, you provide some update there. The account and Where's Dr. General Counsel? Oh, he's not provide there. Some update from the layout last meeting. The yes, accountability. The accountability. Board members. The accountability committee's last <laughs> meeting was on Friday, December first. <laughs> the accountability, uh, where we reviewed statistics from the Transparency and Accountability <laughs> website. Yeah, I mean, uh, looked at comparables between October two thousand sixteen. You know, let me uh, let me remind you, folks, that the transparency Transparency and Accountability is actually very good. All right, so I'm going to give TriMet credit for that. That's actually it's very good. They do have a lot of information. But nobody knows it's there. They don't. They don't really tell you. I mean, I I watch social media. I know what they're talking about. That they don't ever tell you that's there. Okay, it is there, but they don't tell you it's there. Just like they don't tell. You think TriMet would tweet on the day of the board meeting? Listen to our board meeting. It's live right now. Or they put it on their. No, they don't do that. Now, why don't they do that? Because they don't really want you to see it. Or they would do it. Okay, they would tell you it's going on. They don't. To the website's uh, statistics from October 2017. So we looked at a month to month comparison over the last year. Um, there were 838 page views uh, <laughs> at the accountability site. No, 838 page views. That's ridiculously low. Okay, <laughs> that's low because nobody knows it's there. And half of those are mine. You know? <laughs> I click there all the time. In October 2017 compared to 638 in October of 2016, uh, which is a 21%. The Deacon Blue has more page views than the TriMet Accountability Center. Increase over the previous year. The top 10 most viewed pages, Darn. starting from the highest, was the public records request page. Yeah, that's a good one. Followed by ridership I and performance statistics. The performance dashboard, the TriMet Board of Directors meetings schedule, the 2018 adopted budget, TriMet's labor contract, TriMet's 2017 audited financial statements, its executive team members, the agency org chart, and the public records request log. Those were the top ten. The last request log uh, the was committee last. member Dave Whipple provided a report to the committee on some wonderful upcoming changes to TriMet.org, which will be debuted in 2018. Uh, specifically, it will make it a lot easier for our writers to navigate through from their mobile phones uh, our website and use our trip planning tools um, and transit tracker. Uh, we also received a report from internal auditor and accountability committee member Darlene Gastineau and paralegal Chris Connor, who administers our ethics point hotline. Uh, and while there were five reports to the ethics hotline uh, in 2017. So the ethics hotline, I don't talk about it. I don't ever see anybody talking. I, you know, I belong to some of the TriMet employee uh, Facebook, private Facebook. They never talk about it because they don't know it's there. Nobody knows it's there. Nobody watches this. I, I'm crazy enough to watch this, and only 20 or 30 people will watch what I'm doing. Nobody sees this shit, okay? Nobody sees it. Uh, 
none of them was a type one report of fraud, waste, or abuse of tenant resources. Rather, they were all type two reports, which properly belong in and were forwarded to other departments uh, for review and investigation, for example, human resources. Our next accountability committee meeting is scheduled for Friday, June 15th, 2018. That's it. I think ah, the board has any questions. Ah, boy, Shelly. Devi oh, Shelly Devine. Porno or star. Shelly Devine, our general counsel. <laughs> <laughs> what are they laughing at? Sina, thank you very much. It's helpful. All right, let's move on then to the Metro Policy Advisory Committee uh, uh, or MPAC. What's this? I'm not watching that. Let's go past. Okay, wait. We'll go back. I see McFarland. So. Here's your manager's report. Mr. General, General manager, manager, now this is what I want. Board, board president, members of the board, and everybody, uh, happy holidays to you all. Um, I wanted to first cover a few statistics about ridership. We just got these in, so I can't say that we've dug into them quite the way we normally do, given our meetings a little bit earlier in the month than, uh, than typical. Um, but in November, uh, we carried about 7,775,000 trips on, on trucks. It. But I would tell you, overall weekly ridership was down to about about 2.8 percent compared to November of last year. So we're sort of looking into the yeah, the people aren't riding. And if you're following my feed or TriMet Scanner feed, you know why? I mean, don't listen to their bullshit. We know they don't why they don't ride because it's fucking inconvenient. It's not. It's not that it's unsafe because statistically, transit is a lot safer than your car, but it's unpleasant. It's unpleasant to ride transit. This was this this. Did you happen to get and see that uh, Jarrett Walker Elon Musk feud that went on? And I got to tell you, Jarrett Walker handled that like a champ. I mean, Jarrett Walker is this guy really knows what he's doing. That, I'd love to see Jarrett Walker as a as the general manager of TriMet. Wouldn't that be fantastic? Really. Uh, and I don't always agree with Jarrett, as you know. But I mean, this good fucking guy is smart. Um, yeah, people don't ride it because it sucks. Uh, uh, where and how and what the characteristics of the month may have been that affected that. What was unusual was they actually saw a decrease in Max um, peak hour ridership. Which oh, has not been the trend. Yeah, uh, because Max been has been before. breaking down every um, fucking day. We also saw fewer people using our frequent service bus lines. Uh, weekly ridership on those services dropped two point nine percent. The bright spot was, of course, the orange line, which um, saw... The orange line, which, by the way, has not even, at this date, achieved the first year ridership projections that TriMet made when they started, okay? It's going up, yeah, but it hasn't even met the first year projections, just like Wes. Uh, an increase of about 2% over uh, last year. Um, so, again, um, we'll continue to dig into these writers. Yeah, you'll I dig think into the same yeah, general we'll trends that. that we reviewed with you uh, at your retreat uh, last month. But, I, again, um, those, are, those are troubling numbers at some level, so we'll be making sure that we understand them fully. Well, at least he acknowledges that. I mean, people aren't riding TriMet, okay? And, and the decline in TriMet ridership has really been since he's been in there, okay? This guy. Okay, his neoliberal administration is really, it's not only has it harmed the ridership, but it's, it's harmed the employees too. He has not been a good general manager. I'm sorry to have to report that. He is not. And um, I know the media is making a hero out of him, of course. But those of us that follow the material know he's no hero. He's, he's actually hurt TriMet tremendously. As you know, they didn't get the, uh, they're not going to do the bond this year. Why not? Because they, they know what we know, which is that Tri the public doesn't view TriMet in a, in a positive way. And why should they? It's been failing them. Uh, I would just note that I think, and Doug will go through, Doug Kelsey will go through uh, performance of the system. It actually has been uh, improving. So, again, I think these are, uh, these, these are really interesting numbers for us to dig into. Well, I can actually uh, think. I actually can say that I think that it actually has. I th I see a lot more buses being filled than used to be. They're, they really seem like they actually are trying to keep more people available to work extra. Uh, because I noticed listening to the scanner stuff that there's more buses being filled now than there used to be. 
or they used to just cancel them and now they're actually filling runs they're trying to keep runs on time so there is some definite improvement there and even me you know even I'm verifying that and you know that I wouldn't do that if I didn't think it was true I have a number of other updates that I would like to invite some uh, of our staff up to provide you. One is we had a very uh, important announcement related to our... Don't you think, Neil? <laughs> I don't think... You know, look at Neil now and look at Neil when he started. He he does not look good. You know, I think this has been a lot of stress for him, and it should have been, okay? It should have been. He, he didn't... You know, my personal appeal, a feeling of Neil McFarlane is I think he basically is a good guy, but... He put himself in this position where he had to follow this agenda that maybe he doesn't actually agree with in his own personal mind. But he's, you know, a neoliberal manager and he has to follow the neoliberal agenda. And I think it's I think it's affected him. I, I really do. And, you know, maybe I'm um, speaking off the top of my head or I don't know what I'm talking about. But I, I think that Neil has not enjoyed his last, what is it, seven or eight years as a general manager, and he shouldn't have because he presided over a, a very unethical period of TriMet uh, management. Top pass pass system yesterday. Chris Tucker, could you come forward, please? And I think you have a general update for the board, and you can also fill us in on the um, improvements that um, that you announced yesterday. All right, we'll we'll stop it there for now. I'll pick this up probably tomorrow. Um, yeah, this th you know it's important to watch this because these this these are the people that actually control the destinies of everybody else. I know it's hard to watch because they intentionally make it boring, but these are these aristocrats, and that's what he is. He's an aristocrat. He's he's a agent of the oligarchy. You know. Um, uh, he, he is the one implementing the ideas of the neoliberal oligarchy. And they, they make sure they pay these people well for this. I mean, he'll retire with a nice fat pension, what, somewhere between thirteen and 15000 a month. You know, he'll never have a problem uh, affording to live in Portland like people like me. I can't live in Portland anymore, but he can. Uh, you know, he's done his duty, and they'll, they'll uh, pay him off well for that. But I don't think he's enjoyed it. I really, you know, I ran into him once in the airport. I just ran into him out of the blue. He's coming, and he's. I remember when he came out, he just was shocked that I was there. He knows who I am, obviously. And I said to him, and I, I still believe it. You know, Neil, you could have been a real, you could have, you know, because this guy here, he's really responsible for the light rail in the Portland area. This guy this guy oversaw the building of all the light rail lines. And whether you like, don't like light rail or like light rail, you know, it's been very controversial. In the long run, I'm sure it will be a good investment. In the short term, it's bad, but in the long term, good, I, I think. Um, he really was the man that oversaw that. This is the chief engineer here. And that's quite an accomplishment that he could feel good about, but he decided he wanted to be general manager, and it kind of uh, dragged him down at the pit of, uh, I don't know what you'd call it. I don't want to be too mean to the guy. I mean, I spent the last five years putting penises on his head, I, you know, and I'm kind of going to miss him when he leaves, because I'm so used to seeing him at this point. I don't think he really enjoyed doing what he did, but he did a lot of bad shit, man, okay? And there, it's just too bad that he had to resort to that. 